Hall, and I ask you to please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Latosha Brown. I wanted to start my talk in such a way as I normally do because I think it's really important for us to think about when we're talking about having this conversation about democracy, it's not just about the process and the policies of democracy. In fact, it's really about the spirit of humanity. And there's something about music and art that forces us for just a brief moment to sit in the space of our humanity and do nothing else but listen and to be a part and at some point allow that music even even if it just touches our moment, touches our spirit in that moment, then it has done its job. And so I bring to you greetings from Atlanta, Georgia, where I reside, but I am a child and a native of Selma, Alabama. Anybody ever heard of Selma, Alabama? And so the reason why I sang a little snippet of those two songs in particular, because there were a group of people in this small city that I'm from called Selma, Alabama, that had the audacity to believe that even though they didn't have government on their side, even though in many ways their own humanity was being attacked every single day of their lives, they were marginalized economically, politically, socially, but what they had is they had the power of the spirit in their heart and the belief in their humanity, and they stood on the Edmund Pettus Bridge and they shifted this nation and are thinking about democracy, not just for black people in Selma, Alabama, but they opened up the space for us to think about democracy for all of us. That is what can happen when we're standing in the fullness of our power and that we allow our humanity to be the very thing to shape who we are and those things that we believe in. And so in the spirit of those same people that were in Emma Pettus Bridge that had the audacity to get to the top of the bridge and kneel down and pray. And in the midst of that, many of you may be familiar with what was called Bloody Sunday and Turnaround Tuesday. And for praying, and once they made it the next time to the foot of the bridge, they were beaten back by the state troopers. Yet they persisted. What would make you persist when you know that you're at a political disadvantage? When you know you're at an economic disadvantage? That you know that structural racism is a part of the very fabric of this nation? What would make you show up again? The spirit of your humanity, you have to recognize. Those people recognize that their humanity was not something that the United States government had the right to grant them that they were granted that in their birth. Those people had the belief that who they were in their agency to be able to speak to, literally being able to participate in a democratic process so that they would actually have the power to make and in, have input on decisions made by them and their, for them and their families, they recognized that the power of that was not just something that they were granted by the Constitution, but their humanity gave them license for that. And so I offer that to you at the beginning of this talk to say, can we reclaim our humanity? 
And so while, yes, this seems like this is a discussion that we should be in a moment to talk about democracy, let me tell you, I've talked to those folks, many of those people who are on the bridge, many of the leaders of it, such as Reverend C.T. Vivian and Reverend James Orange were mentors of mine. And they told me that no, they weren't doing all of that work just so that they could vote because the vote would validate them. They were doing that vote, they were doing that work because they knew that voting and democracy was a means to an end, not an end in itself. That was about the affirmation of their humanity and their power as human beings and saying that they had agency and to be able to shape the future that they envisioned for themselves, their children and their children's children. And so here we are in this moment in 2021 and the United States of America that we're still grappling with this question, can we provide equal and fair access to all the citizens of this nation? And not only is that question, unfortunately, what we're dealing with right now, but many parts of this country, what we're hearing is, or we're seeing the actions that suggest that it should not be. And so what I want you all to do, I do this everywhere I go. It doesn't matter whether I'm teaching a class at Harvard or whether I'm on a basketball court in Greensboro, North Carolina. I want you all, wherever you are right now, I want you to kind of get centered, clear your mind, clear your spirit. I want you to, I'm going to ask you two questions and I'm going to ask you these questions. I do it everywhere. And I'm going to ask you to close your eyes where you are right now. Just trust me. Close your eyes. Kind of get grounded. See your feet as if you are rooted in the ground and your, your mind is kind of open for the sun. And so hear this question with your heart. What would America be without racism? How would this nation look without racism? What would Minnesota look like if all of her citizens felt valued and respected? Now open your eyes. I know that wasn't a long time to ponder two very important questions. But I raise those questions because the majority of us have never been even asked that question. No matter where I go, 99% of the room has never been asked the question of what would America look like without racism. And I raise that in a point, name one thing that has been brought into physical being that was not first envisioned. There is nothing that comes out in the physical world that we don't first envision. Whether it's a bottle of water, whether it's the pews that we sit on, or whether it's the car that we drive in, someone had to envision it. So how will we create a nation that is free from racism if we're not seeing ourselves as visionary leaders to think about the possibilities and the potential of what would exist if racism was uprooted in this country? Instead of dealing with racism as it is a transaction, what if we created a framework to deal with racism and the transformative power of our own humanity if we end it an artificial construct that has led to some people being oppressed, that has led to all of us being impacted. It actually keeps us from our highest and our best selves. And what does that have to do with democracy? Everything. Because at the core belief of democracy is believe that all people should have a voice. And one of the pieces that prevent us from doing that in this nation is the belief that all people are not equal and endowed by their creator for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What is the potential for this nation if we created a nation and systems that centered the belief that all people should have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? 
Oh, my, my, my. Can you see it? Can you imagine it? And the reason why I'm bringing that question, if we're not asking ourselves the question of what America would look like without racism, we will never achieve that because it's literally we'll just be addressing, we will be responding instead of radically reimagining. I would challenge you to see that racism doesn't just hurt black people or brown people, that racism impacts all of us. We sit here now in the wealthiest country in the world, yet our health care system is not competitive to other countries with the resources and the size. Why is that? Racism! And that doesn't affect me or just my family. It has an impact on all of us. And so I come to you today sharing for us to be reflective of some of the challenges, but I came here to bring the good news. The good news is every single creation, every single system that has been created and imagined by man can be recreated. It can be radically reimagined. Yes, we have the resources that if we have the political will, we could literally create a system, a democratic system that said that it was inclusive, that was reflective of the population, that we could tap into the time, the treasures, and the talents of all the millions of beautiful people that live in this nation. What it's going to require us to do, family, is that we're going to have to have courage. And you know, in courage, what brings up courage? You don't need courage when everything is going fine. You don't need courage when there's no feeling of a, of a threat. Courage is exactly what is developed and sharpened in the midst of fear and challenges. And so at this moment that we find ourselves, I don't know, I say this often, if people are going to be talking about 2003. I don't even remember what happened in 2003 or 2006. What I know for sure is that we will be talking about 2020 and 21, this period in this era that we're in right now. And we think that what we're dealing with in this question of democracy, we think that what we're dealing with is we're dealing with a political crisis. No, it's not a political crisis. It is a moral crisis. We're fundamentally dealing with a framework and a paradigm that says if you participate in the process and I don't like the way that you vote or who you voted for, I am going to punish you. That is political corruption by its very definition. We are dealing in a context that says if you are not a part of the power making, um, the power making strategy or a person of power, it should be a little bit more difficult for you to vote. So what do we do? I'm glad that you asked. So I have what I often refer to as the V strategy. And I'm going to quickly go through what I call is the V strategy. And there are five things I want you to remember, what I think that we're being called for, because I think the ultimate question is, what are we being called for in this moment? And in this moment, we have to reclaim our humanity. We cannot continue to operate in this context that literally this is just about political differences. Our lives are not a football game. People ask you, are you blue, are you red, are you on the right, are you the left? I'm on the human team, the humanity team. That's who I am. And whatever context helps us to think how do we advance humanity, that is, I think, our only, only, only path forward. The only thing that can allow us to move past and transcend how we see these limitations of race, and we're all impacted by it, class, and we're all impacted by it, is this notion of something that I call for the love of humanity. And certainly we will have differences, but the way that we would deal with those differences would be very different. If in the Congress right now, if the center belief and value was the love of humanity, imagine what policies would come out. 
Would that mean that there wouldn't be policy differences? Absolutely. I tell people all the time, I don't even agree with my own self in a week. I differ from myself, but my values don't shift. And so if the value was based on the love of humanity, the con kind of conversations, the kind of struggle, the kind of differences we would see would be distinctively different. They would be rooted in a different kind of value, which means there would be a willingness for us to work things out. And so in my V strategy, the five V's I want to lift up real quick is the first one, which is what I ask you all. The first thing that I asked was to envision what America would look like without racism. What would Minnesota look like? And I even raised Minnesota. Minnesota, this is the place that literally what we saw and witnessed with George Floyd was the largest uprising ever in this nation. And yes, it makes us feel uncomfortable. And it should have because we're being called for something greater right now. And so at the place where we saw so much pain and trauma, and that literally wound up being the apex of where we are right now as we're thinking about police reform in this nation, as we're thinking about justice in this nation, as we're thinking about how do we make an alignment with human values of how we keep our communities safe, perhaps it happened here in Minnesota so that Minnesota can also be the leader in the solution to the problem that we saw. Perhaps Minnesota, the place where we saw the pain take place, could be the place of promise. My grandmother used to often say, wherever there's great pain, there's promise. And she had all these sayings, what God, what the devil meant for harm, God would use for your good. That we have to also see that when these things come up, we shouldn't run from them. We should lean into them because there's something I think the universe is trying to show us and teach us about ourselves and give us the opportunity to reframe and reclaim our humanity and literally take and elevate this nation to where she should be. Because we have not, we are going to have to be honest. In many ways, we've hidden behind American exceptionalism, as if democracy is the business that already was taken care of. Yet we know it has not been. It has not been achieved. It's been aspirational at most. And there are elements in this country. I can't say um, that there are not elements in this country that lend itself to democracy. That's part of the reason why I'm a voting rights activist. But I must say that we have to be honest about where we are so that we can literally be honest about what it's going to take for us to go to the next level. And so in these five V's, the first one being vision. There is a scripture that says people without a vision will perish. That's true. There's nothing that can be brought into the physical world that was not first envisioned. We have to spend some time asking ourselves, what would this country look like without racism? Imagine what that would look like. Have our imagination so that we have a vision that transcends what we see already. Or we will be in this perpetual cycle of responding in the moment and running out of fear or having disagreements that have false equivalencies. You're either on this side or this side. So we have to have vision. And we have to have vision of something greater. And yes, it can be scary because we haven't seen it before. But neither did the founders of this nation. And so I ask you in your vision that as you think about going forward, that we start thinking not just as citizens of America, but what if you thought like a founder of a new America, a more inclusive, a more just, a more equitable America? Would that not be better for all of us? But for us to get there, we're gonna have to be visionaries. The second thing is around voice. That part of what we have to recognize right now is that there is a need for us to create, give grace and create space for new voices to be a part of the shaping of what we're talking about democracy. It sounds good theoretical, but what that means is are we prepared for pluralism? If we've not created spaces to have a divergence and a difference in ideas, 
we're, we're going to have a very, very hard time of creating the kind of democratic institutions that we desire. And so what I offer is that we've got to create space and grant grace for new voices to be brought to the table so that we can shape something in the spirit of pluralism. The third thing is victory. We have to shift the paradigm of what a victory looks like. Right now in the political spectrum, it's like a football game. It's like if we're in the Super Bowl, you're on the red team or the blue team. No. We have to literally look at how can we have a win-win. Yes, there will be differences, but the love of humanity should never be negotiated or compromised. And so we've got to shift this paradigm and get out of these binaries of win and loss in this very narrow scope of partisan politics. My right to vote should not be contingent upon whether the Democrats are in office. That's as problematic to me as the Republicans literally in the state that I'm in trying to tear it down. My right to vote should be protected regardless of what political party is in power. And so should yours. And so as I and speaking of football games, someone asked me, you know, did I have purple on for the Vikings? Now listen, y'all, I am from Atlanta. I am a Falcon. But be very clear, I am wearing purple because I am the biggest Prince fan ever in the history of Prince fans. <laughs> and so there's something, I went to Paisley Park, and there's something about that I just want to lift up even in his legacy. Right, there's something about being a visionary and creating and bringing things into being that others could not see. There was something about in Paisley Park that I noticed when he actually painted in, if you ever go into Paisley Park, he paints um, clouds because he said he wanted people to think unlimited. Think of the limitless possibilities that exist if human beings are able to operate and stand in the fullness of their power. That's what moment we're in right now. And so when we think about victory, we've got to shift what that looks like. And it has to be driven by our vision, and we've got to make space and grant grace for voice. The fourth V is, this I think is the most critical one out of everything that I'm saying today. And it's really about values. We are literally in a challenging moment that we are afraid to actually say what this is really about. This is really about values this whole fight about democracy, we reduced it to an electoral strategy or an electoral outcome, when in fact it's really about values. Every single human being should have the right to have input on decisions that impact their lives. Don't you agree? And we will be the more better for that. And so as we're talking about literally how we go forward, we cannot get caught up and the political punditry of this is really about uh, uh, political parties or political candidates, we have to recognize that right now, we are literally defining what we believe about human value. And the fifth and the final one, you probably could guess this one, vote. This is about voting, but I also, but I want to shift the paradigm of how I talk about voting. That is, we look at voting in this very transactional kind of way, right? There's an election that's coming up, there's a candidate that you like, right? And you're going to go and vote and we're going to change everything. I'm going to ask everybody in here right now, everybody that's listening, how many of you all have voted for a candidate that disappointed you? How many of y'all went to vote, but you really didn't want to go vote? How many of y'all felt that voting was going to give you some benefit, but not the benefit that you want? The truth of the matter is we've all felt that way on some level. And I'm raising this because we have to have an honest conversation, particularly with young people, about voting. We can no longer go out and give this mantra that voting is going to solve all the problems because it is not. That voting is one tool 
It can reduce the harm for communities. We have to talk about the power of voting, but we also have to speak to the limitations of voting. So that as we are moving forward, and we're talking about voting, we're engaging people in a conversation that is greater than about the vote. We're, we need to literally remind people that they have power, and voting is one tool to access that power. And so as we're talking about democracy, what is the opportunity that exists? The last thing that I will say connected to that is, there is an opportunity for us right now to set the course of what this nation will look like the next 100 years. And it's not about the political candidates. It's not about the political parties. We will set our stake in the ground of what we believed about human value and what we believed about human agency and what we believed about the possibility that could be. And so the good news is that we have a generation of young people that think very differently, that they don't have the same kind of affection to political parties. And that's a good thing that they don't have the same kind of belief that we can just continue the same way we're continuing without changing anything. They're our visionaries. And we also in this process have to find room to create space and have grace to lift them up in their leadership. And so as I close, I want to remind you of the question I asked you earlier. What would this nation look like without racism? What are the possibilities that could exist in the state of Minnesota if we all created a government where people felt respected and valued? I didn't say liked. I didn't even say loved. I think I, I have, I said respected and valued. What are the immense possibilities that exist in this state? Well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Thank you. Thank you, Latosha Brown. This is the Westminster Town Hall Forum coming to you from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, senior minister here at Westminster and moderator of the forum. Our guest speaker today is Latosha Brown, the co-founder of Black Voters Matter. If you're here in the sanctuary, we invite you to write a question on a card and hold it up for our ushers to collect. If you're watching online, Please put your question into the chat below the YouTube or Facebook video. While the ushers begin collecting questions, I'd like to thank our broadcast partner, Minnesota Public Radio. For the first time ever, NPR will broadcast this fall's forums as a special week of programs. You can hear all of our fall programs on democracy on NPR each day the week of November 29th to the 2nd. This is the week right after Thanksgiving, every day at 11 a.m. All these forums are also available as a video at any time on the forum website and Facebook page. Thanks as well to our media sponsors, MinPost, a source for nonpartisan news coverage. Find more at MinPost.com and to Sahan Journal. Learn more about Sahan at SahanJournal.com. Today is the third forum of our fall season focusing on democracy. We invite you to learn more about the other talks in our series with Jose Antonio Vargas, Dr. Wendy Chun, and coming up on November 16th, Chief Judge John R. Tunheim. Go to our website, westminsterforum.org. And now, Latosha Brown, if you are ready, I'll invite you back into the pulpit so we can present questions from the audience. I want to begin with uh, kind of bringing you down to the earth a little bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot on vision, a lot on values, but you're an organizer. I am. You're an organizer, and you have organized well, uh, starting with your first major campaign, I think, with Doug Jones in Alabama, right. and then on to Georgia and other elections. Can you tell us what's the secret sauce? What makes it work? Yeah. 
Thank you for asking that question. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, it seems like the vision is different, but it actually is the driver underneath that. That it has to be something greater. You have to create a greater piece for us. I, and I share this with, with people. In Alabama, in this particular race, it was a U.S. Senate race. We didn't particularly, we as a community could actually assert, could literally create our collective power. And that something had to be different. There needed to be an intervention. And so in many ways, that's what we did. In terms of how we organized, we organized in a particular kind of way that I'll just share some quick points around. One thing that we did is we decided that we would actually do three things. One, we would actually move money. And so we invested money on the ground to grassroots groups, normal organizations that are not seen as part of the ecosystem. So instead of the traditional organizations that do political work, we would mobilize with groups that were grassroots groups. The second thing is that the message mattered and that we had to literally move a message that wasn't candidate centered and it wasn't centered on the party, that we literally had to center voters in that message. So we created a message that basically our campaign was, it's not about, we literally had commercials that this isn't about the Democrats, this isn't about the Republicans, this is about you. And so we had to shift the paradigm of who was centered in that. And then the third thing we had to do is create the infrastructure for mobilization. And so what we did is we organized grassroots groups to work together collaboratively in a coordinated way so that literally they could share resources, share vans. And so in the Black Belt alone, we had over 33 organizations that were working together in a coordinated fashion that normally are kind of working kind of isolated, that we were able to create a model and a plan for them to work in a coordinated way. And part of the reason why this work has continued, and we, because we see this work as not being transactional just around the election, and I think the other difference is that we didn't work with groups just because they were electoral groups, or even some of the groups we worked with did not just do electoral work. Um, and so with the difference, we all say these two quick points, was that we literally opened it up to see who were the people who were trusted messengers in the community that we could tap into and really be able to coordinate with them. And then we would also continue to work with them after the election. So after the election, we did a debriefing with those same groups. We've continued to work with those same groups. Matter of fact, I just was on a call with, with them three days ago. And so we had to see this work as 365 days out of the year so that it wasn't just based on a particular election, but it was really centered around this notion of how could we build collective power. I've heard you tell the story, Latosha, about the Pensacola, Florida, and the school board election there. Can you tell our audience about that? It's a remarkable story following up on what you just said. So quickly, I'll just say that there was a governor's election, a big uh, gubernatorial election in 2018 in the state of Florida. Some of you all may remember. And that was the key. All of the, fo the, all of the focus in that state and even resources was around this election. There were two things. There was the election of the, the governor's race, and there was also a ba um, ballot measure for the restoration of voting rights of formerly incarcerated people. And both of those things were actually high up on the um high up on the ever level of interest. And so we went to Pensacola, Florida, which was a part of the panhandle in Florida. And normally, and, and as we were in there, we were in a, a room that was filled, back-to-back um, -back people, and we were talking about this governor's race, because that's what everybody was talking about. And every once in a while, somebody would stand up and say, yeah, it's just kind of like that school board race. And it would be almost like an uh, undertone. Right, it's like that school board race. And we would keep talking. And then another, the second time it came up, maybe the second or third time it came up, the school board race, we stopped the conversation. It was like, wait a minute. What are you all, you all talking about the school board race? It was like, oh, it's just a little local race that's right here. But essentially what happened is in this particular school board race, the African-American community in the 1970s in a lawsuit, they had, to, they had agreed to a consent decree they should not have in light of at this point because of population growth, they should have had two seats. But for, in the 1970s, I think it was 1972, they had agreed to a consent decree that there would be one member that would be a minority member always on the school board, right? And so the governor of the state of, of, of Florida decided when that seat came open that a min he would appoint a, a white a female Republican as a minority. And so there was no representation, no, mi mo no minority representation on the board, and the people were, di they were dejected by this. And so when we heard that, we said, well, is that the seat y'all are interested? It was like, yeah, but it's just a little local seat. We was like, but that matters because you matter. So if that's the campaign you want to focus on, let's focus on that campaign. And so what we did is we shifted and focused with this community on that campaign. Not only did they get their seat back, but the highest turnout for a gubernatorial election in that district ever resulted because we 
invested in what they saw as important. That all we hear in policy one-on-one, that all politics are local, but we usually operate the difference. And so in that lesson, what we realize is it's not just the top of the ticket that can drive the ticket. The bottom of the ticket can actually drive the ticket because literally if you're engaging people or what's important to them, then they will show up. It's hard to get excited about a governor's race when you've lost control of your school board or your local uh, county commission. Speaking of local elections, <laughs> one week from today here in Minneapolis, we will be voting for a, a mayor and city council members and a couple of, uh, well, actually several uh, proposals that would uh, change the city in terms of its governance and, uh, and uh, institute police reform by a couple of different ways, depending on how you slice it. I don't know if you know anything about that. You do. I thought you might. Uh, <laughs> Anything you'd like to say to us, many of us who will be voting on these uh, issues in just uh, seven days? Let me just say this. You know, I am, um, I'm, of course, I'm not from um, Minnesota. And so I know that there is, there's very, there's a nuanced conversation. But let me just say this to you all. The, pe the reason why I know the world is watching. Minnesota, I want you all to hear what I'm saying. The world is watching. You know, this was a place that what we saw is we saw um, and learned about the history of racism within policing in this, in, in this state. We can't deny it. We can't say it didn't happen. It's here. And there is a long history of it being here. And I'm raising that because there's a particular opening and a question for you that you have to decide, right? Are you going to continue in the structure that has existed? And how has that worked? Or could we have the courage to imagine something different so all of the citizens in this state could feel respected and valued? It goes back to my initial talk. And so I'm raising this because I want you all to recognize that you are literally setting the tone that I think the nation, this would be the first state to actually deal with something around a real opportunity to look at police reform differently. I was watching a documentary of the history of how literally policing came about. Even in this state, policing started two years after slavery. We know that the whole idea and the framework of, of policing was created and modeled after slave patrols. And there's no need for us to actually operate in denial. Could we radically reimagine a system that really was about public safety? And so I just offer to you all, you know, instead of like taking a position, I would offer to you all, you have three opportunities. One, you have an opportunity to set the tone of how the leadership will go forward. Secondly, you have the opportunity to set a policy, something in place that can actually help, I think, reshape, you know, as we're looking at policing in this country. And the third thing is, I think you are sending, you have the opportunity to send a message that there is a response that what we witnessed, the world witnessed in George Floyd murder, that this community was deeply impacted by it and that you all have the courage and the character to create something different to at least address some of the systemic structural racist issues that exist in the city. That That was a very tactful answer. Uh, and I want to note that this forum will be heard on December 1st right. by Minnesota Public Radio audience. And what I think you said is, no matter what happens next week on December 1st, we'll still be facing the same issues. Oh, without question. You know, we can't uproot. Let's think about this 200 years of oppression. That doesn't get un unraveled with one election or one person. We, there has to be a sustained committed effort to uproot structural racism that will literally, it deserves the same amount of energy that was put in it to create it. And so Monty Rivers will feel drop by drop. I am saying that once you open up the space, that's where you can tap into the possibilities and the potential of what could be and what exists. And so yes, there's a vote that happens, right? But there's a larger piece. It goes back to that radical reimagining, that vision that I shared with you all. It is time. It is time for us to forge a new future. And the good news is we have the opportunity to do so. Amen.
We have a number of students here from uh, University of St. Thomas, the Doherty Family Center, and one of them is asking this question. How do you keep your spirit of humanity oh. and not lose it when you feel like you are not making a difference? Mm, let me say this. I am a, let me say this. I am a black woman from the deep south in a state called Alabama. My family, actually, my great-great-great-grandmother was purchased and brought 30 minutes from my house that I grew up in that if I didn't have hope, and my family didn't have hope, and my people didn't have hope, I wouldn't be here before you today. I'm a nation that actually, my ancestors were treated as if they were chattel slavery. That my family, including my grandparents, picked cotton, as they would say, from sun up to sundown. That my grandfather, whose father, who, who, his father, he was half white, left him 300 acres of land and his white cousins took all of our inheritance once he died. Yet I stand. I am a person, I'm raising that because if we don't have hope, what then do we have? And I'm, we have to, and it's hard to have hope when you don't have a vision. I have the audacity to believe that this nation can become a nation that all human beings are treated with dignity and respect. That's what drives me. If I focus on just what I see, I will never be here. If I focus on what's happening in Georgia right now, when we did all of this work, and, at, and just in a month ago, 100,000 voters were purged from the list and continue to be purged, yet I persist because I believe that my humanity was not something that was legislated to me, it was not something that somebody can grant me. It is something that the spirit of who I am cannot be destroyed in life or in death. And so part of what drives me, right, and I know that's kind of uncomfortable question sometimes for folks because they're like, yeah, yeah, bring it down to earth. This is the only way that I can say it. The only way I can say it, there's something within me that believes that every, with every fiber in my being that I'm whole and complete. There is something in me that believes that human beings should be treated as if they're valued. I don't know where I got it from, I just feel it. There's something in me that believes that love can trump hate. It doesn't matter what it looks like, I believe that. And so sometimes when I don't have anything else, y'all, when I don't have any other thing, when the politics are disheartening, I'm upset right now that I'm in 2021 and we're still having a conversation of whether black people should have equal access to the ballot. Do you know how disheartening that is? But I wouldn't have hope if I believed that that was the system that is going to develop. What gives me hope is you. That I literally believe that there is a generation that's coming after me. That, that there's a generation that you all have a much more expanded idea of how you see gender, how you see justice how you are literally addressing and challenging systems, oppressive systems every day, that literally is what gives me hope. That I know that I'm not alone and that I'm part of a line of people who have always resisted with righteousness and that there will continue to be people after me that will do the same. You, you referred to the purging of roles in, in Georgia and uh, we should not uh, miss this opportunity to ask you about what happened in Washington in Congress last week with the failure to pass uh, a, a, men, a, a bill that would have supported more open voting rights. What's going on in the U.S. Congress in terms of the values that are being uh, displayed in the votes taken there? And, and we have to recognize that we're in, I think there's two pieces for us to recognize. One, I think that we're in a, um, a po political realignment era, right? The political landscape is reshaping. Right, and so but as it's reshaping, the question is, what are we going to do to shape how it goes forward? And so what we saw in the vote last week is we saw where not a single Republican actually voted just for open debate around voting rights when we know that in 48 states in this nation, there are bills being introduced to marginalize the power and make voting at less accessible. And so I'm raising that, I'm not raising it in a, even in a partisan context. It is, that is factual. And so we have to really recognize that democracy is being under attack. 
And it's not just, we can see it right now, we can see it, the face of it may look like an intent black voters, but that will unravel and impact democracy for all of us. Can you all imagine that if we create a system that when you vote for somebody that literally you are punished for voting from them? That's political corruption at its definition. And so we have to recognize how vulnerable we all are with this voting, uh, with the voting rights struggle. The second part that I'll raise to that too is we also have to equally hold the Democrats accountable. The bottom line is not only do they have the numbers, and yes, they didn't have the numbers to be able to meet the filibuster, but there has to be a serious conversation about why are you holding on to the filibuster, particularly around this issue. The whole notion of voting rights should be a non-negotiable. Why are we here? And part of the reason that we're here, it is at the intersection of structural racism, it is at the intersection of us really not being able to have a firm understanding of what democracy is, and then the third thing is understand our role in sustaining and advancing and the evolution of democracy. That to each generation, it, becomes, it should become stronger and more accessible and more available. And so in this moment, I challenge all of us, how are we going to move forward? We will move forward to the pace in which we set. How much is fear driving what's happening in, either in Congress or in the states around the country? Fear, the role of fear. Yeah, you know, I think that fear is, I think part of what, more than a political war, y'all, I think we're in a narrative war. I think we're in a narrative war that there's a particular kind of frame you know, that people, this is the challenge with fear. I always use like fear and love. You know, people ask me, does fear work in organizing? Absolutely, right? When people are fearful or they're afraid, they respond quickly. If we hear, like just by, if we hear a, a, a shot that we think are gunshots, our natural reaction is the duck. Think later, respond. And so fear has this way of getting us to respond in the moment. The challenge with fear is that it can't be sustained. That is only so far it can take us. Love, a difference, is that love can be sustained. And so we have to, st we have to literally operate from that space that continues to say, and when I say love, I'm not talking about the romantic love, even though I like romantic love too, don't you? <laughs> and some of y'all have some sustained romantic love. I've not gotten there yet, but I'm on my way. <laughs> But there is a, an opportunity when I say the love of humanity, that's what I'm saying, that there's something that actually we love, just this very spirit of humanity that will continue to drive us in a way. And so when we're talking about fear happening all over the country, that there's this idea of we have to hold on to what we have, that there's this idea that's pushing in this, this notion of in the white community that we've got to hold up these structures that protect white interests, because if not, what is going to happen to us is that we're going to be destroyed. Let me say this, that I, some of the most gracious people I know have been black folks from the deep south and black people in this country. If we were not gracious, this country would be built burnt to the ground. Now that's not a popular saying, but it's true. We have shown and demonstrated over and over again in our humanity of how we would show in spite of the racism, in spite of the mistreatment, in spite of the inequities. So what is the fear really based in? And so I recognize and I push you in your thinking around what fear is and as you are speaking about these issues, how much of this fear are you perpetuating in your families or as you talk about these issues? The bottom line is we've got to shift the even paradigm of how we see things ourselves. I think you just said some of the most gracious people you know. Most are, gracious? Are, yeah, okay. I wanted to be sure because it, with my hearing, it, it sounded like something else. But gracious is good. Oh, what did I say? You said gracious. <laughs> yeah, good. That's right. <laughs> Talk to us about... I'm like, did I say something else? <laughs> Talk to us about the political climate. There's a number of questions coming forward about the disconnect between the values of this nation and the way political leaders are exercising their power. Where's the disconnect and how do we uh, connect them back to the values that, that were uh, at least That's enshrined ideally in the Constitution? That's a great point. The problem is, you all, it's not, this is the problem. The problem is that there's always been an us and them. The problem is that we have, in many ways, we have been 
um, lazy Democratic participants. We vote, and then we go on about our lives. And this laissez-faire approach has actually led to what we're seeing now, and it's been intentional. It's not that we don't want just, it's not just that the political leaders don't want black people to participate. Almost half of the population in this nation don't participate. And that's not by because people don't care. I've yet to met, meet a person that didn't care about something. It is designed in a way that there's a selected, a small group of people who are making decisions and literally can actually go into the space of self-righteousness saying, well, we're doing this is because this is what the people want. <laughs> Joe Manchin is a prime example. In his own state, in West Virginia, overwhelmingly, the people in his state want the Build the Back Belder. Overwhelmingly, they wanted the Freedom to Vote Act. But when you hear him talk, he talks about the people of West Virginia. And so I'm raising that, that if we want to right-size this, that we've got to actually take responsibility. We as citizens in this nation have not taken the full responsibility of what it means to sustain a democracy. We should not allow electors to tell us who the voters are. We should tell them if that, how we want them to rule. And in order to do that, we've got to be engaged in different levels, you all. We can't just be engaged around elections. We've got to create civic organizations. We've got to have town hall meetings. We've got to create policies. You know what corporate America does? I know many of you all do. They have bills already created that they go in their senator's office and it's on his desk. Why should we be doing this as citizens? I actually have this idea and this notion of a project that I'm going to be working at on the next year at Harvard, I want the establishment of Department of Democracy. And what would that be? And some people say, well, you can't do that. Well, why can't we? I don't know if you all know this, but Homeland Security didn't exist. It was created 11 days after 911. And it was created in a way that said, yes, we're looking at domestic terrorism, but we need to have an agency that actually is an interagency that is looking at how do we strengthen domestic security. We, if there's any time that we need to strengthen the security of the democratic rights of the citizens in this country, uh, uh, aside from political partisanship, it is now. And so part of the reason why I want to explore and create this framework of a department of democracy so that there is an agency that is literally focused on making sure that the democratic rights of citizens are protected regardless of what political party is in office and will hold them equally accountable. Time for a short answer. Okay. Uh, leave us. I like words, y'all. <laughs> you told the spirit might strike. I think the yes. spirit has, has landed here. Tell us uh, why we should be hopeful about American democracy. Mm. You know, I always use the story about um, diamonds. You know, what was really interesting is all a diamond is, is a piece of coal under extreme pressure. It is transformed into a diamond. And we know diamonds by its clarity. And so I raise that is in this moment that we've experienced with COVID, this moment that we've experienced with political uncertainty, that in this moment, pressure can do two things. It can either crush you or it can transform you. And so what gives me hope in this moment is that all of these attacks on democracy, because in many ways, you all, we were too comfortable. We were all hiding behind American exceptionalism and say, oh, we got democracy on lock. We got that already when it had never been fully achieved as is laid out in the Declaration of Independence, which I think is one of the most beautiful documents in this nation. And so I'll just say quickly, because he told me quickly, and I'm, and I'm, I'm using words, um, <laughs> that I'll just say quickly, I think this is a defining moment and era for us, that part of what has happened is the sheets have been pulled back, that we are able to see the gaping holes in our democratic system, 
We're seeing those things at work, but we're also seeing some things that need to be tweaked and reimagined. And so that gives us the possibilities of what could be. And so I'm hoping what gives me hope in this moment is that we will not allow this moment of pain just to be a moment of, that is traumatic, but that it will turn into great promise, that literally just as a diamond under pressure, that the pressure that we're experiencing in this moment will actually transform to give us clarity as a nation, that we've got to deal with structural racism, that we've got to deal with economic inequities, that we've got to deal with the systems in this country that allow us to be the wealthiest in the world, but we can't even sustain our people for more than two months. We've got to look at all of those things in a way that gives us promise of the possibilities that could be if we're all standing in the fullness of our power and literally asserting ourselves in a way that we said, by God's will, we will have a democratic nation. Thank you, Latosha Brown. <laughs> Got the pulpit ready for Sunday now. <laughs> Thank you all who are here in-house. We hope to see you on November 16th for that remarkable time with Chief Judge John Tunine when we will actually witness the swearing in of some new citizens who will be participants in our democracy. We'll see you soon. Thanks for being here. Westminster Town Hall Forum.